Time for Focus next, and today we bring you a report from the Philippines, the deadliest country in the world for land rights and environmental activists last year. According to Pan-Asia Pacific, 61 deaths were reported, and many were related to conflicts over mining and agribusiness. Now, those who resist big business often find themselves in the firing line of private security companies and state forces. Last year, martial law was declared in the state of Mindanao, and rights groups say that this is allowing the military to target land defenders, in particular indigenous Lumads. They accuse them of being members of the communist New People's Army. Jack Hewson reports. Filipino rights defenders set out on a journey to the remote hills of southern Mindanao, a region subject to island-wide martial law. According to advocacy group Pan-Asia Pacific, the Philippines was the deadliest country in the world for land and environmental defenders in 2017, with 61 killed. Arlene Perez says it is safer to travel in large numbers. We were told that there are some military guys in this area right now, at the very least. At the most, we hope we don't get massacred or killed. Here in the village of Datul Bonlangan, seven indigenous Lumads were shot dead by the military on December 3rd. The Lumads say it was a massacre of civilians, but the military have denied this, saying there was a crossfire with communist rebels. Yeah, we just arrived. Edwin, who is from this area, is telling the story to the members of the team of really what happened uh, on last December 3. Edwin Glam says the day of the incident began with a district official arriving to persuade their village head, Datu Victor Danyan, to surrender. This is what our village leader, that's who Victor, told him. I'm not a fighter, I'm not a rebel. I'm just defending our land so that mining will not enter our lands. He would also not allow the renewal of the coffee plantations by Konsunji. Konsunji is the name of a group of companies that the Lumads say control the land. They say an affiliate company of Konsunji took their ancestral land unlawfully. Edwin believes that Danyan was targeted because of this resistance. I was standing by that big tree over there. There was a gunshot. And I immediately saw Datu Victor fall to the ground. He was shot in the head and right here in the chest. The gunshot came from that hillside over there. We were afraid that Datu Victor had died, but I picked him up and brought him inside this house. With the death of our leader, our community is calling out for justice that his death doesn't go unnoticed. Responding to the claim that the Konsunji group was responsible for the incident, a parent company spokeswoman said they would not react to hearsay and malicious unsubstantiated reports from unverified third parties. The armed forces of the Philippines declined to comment, but previously have released videos of armed men walking from the scene, proof, they claim, that the Communist New People's Army, or NPA, were present. The NPA have fought an insurgency against the government for 50 years. In Manila, I put these claims to Christina Palabe, a spokeswoman for Carapatan, an NGO that has supported the Lumads. Even if there is a crossfire, that doesn't mean that they can kill Datu Danyan. Even if there are direct armed confrontations of uh, the military and the NPA rebels, a massacre is a massacre. You don't kill civilians, even during situations of armed conflict. The radical disparity between the activist and military narratives make it difficult to know exactly what happened in Datel Bonlangen. But what is clear is that the military and trained militias often intimidate communities to secure land for agribusiness and mining. These images, taken in 2014, show private security firing on Lumads in North Mindanao. In an even more notorious incident in 2015, a Lumad village head was executed in front of his entire community. Here at a demonstration in Manila, Euphemia Kulama tells me how witnessing the execution affected her community. We think that these acts are intended to create a chilling effect on our struggle. But we won't stop because we know that our struggle for our right to self-determination and for our ancestral domain is a just one. We will persevere in our struggle until they respect our right to self-determination. Experiences like Euphemia's have made many Lumads sympathetic to the communist cause. 
But the distinction between communist sympathizer and rebel fighter is often blurred by the authorities. Critics have accused President Duterte of concocting a red scare for political gain. Two-thirds of the Lumads are, uh, constitute the membership of the NPA, the armed force of uh, the Communist Party. I will not wait until uh, they are about to slit our throat. There is actually rebellion in Mindanao. The president has used such fiery rhetoric to justify the one-year extension of martial law in December. This creeping authoritarianism, coupled with the recent breakdown of peace talks with the communist rebels, means tensions will only be ramped up further. As a result, life for the Philippines' land and environmental rights defenders is likely to remain as dangerous as ever. For more on this story, we can bring in David Camhu, resident senior associate at Sciences Po in Paris and co-editor of the Journal of Current Southeast Asian Affairs. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Now, martial law was declared in Mindanao to get rid of the jihadists last year. Now, the government has extended it because they're comparing what they think are rebels to jihadists, essentially. Well, uh, some ways it's interpreted as, uh, as uh, Duterte doing what Marcos did some 40 years ago, that is using la martial law to then extend his term in office, which is limited to a six-year one term. Um, but, yes, there are two, in fact, two Mindanaos. There's the, the, this northern part where we find these indigenous groups uh, defending their land and uh, against mining companies. And in the south, we have a... Uh, a Islamic-inspired insurrection, which is, again, something that's gone on for, for decades, at least maybe even, even a century. Now, the government is denying civilians have been targeted, and, and if any were killed, they're saying uh, it's, it's been crossfire with communist mm. rebels. Uh, given the heavy-handed tactics of the government of Rodrigo Duterte, with the war on drugs, for instance, we, we don't believe them, do no, it is, there's no credibility. You know, the 12,000 people have been killed extrajudicially since the war on drugs has been started. We estimate half of them being killed by the police and the other half by policemen moonlighting or by militias. And so we're in a, a situation where uh, is, uh, the Philippines has, has a strong regime but a weak state. Mm. Uh, we have a situation in which the rule of law doesn't actually function in practice. A country where which is lacking 50,000 magistrates, for example, so that when people are in prison there, they never come to trial. Mm. Uh, and so there is this, you know, the, the use for, well, doing justice yourself and appealing to militias to, in fact, carry out this, these forms of justice. So, so, in this case, really defending mining companies. Now, NGOs are trying to hold the government and, and companies accountable uh, for the violence, but with Rodrigo Duterte in the country's top job, and as you say, there's no rule of law in, mm. in many parts, um, is there any hope at all? Well, there, there is hope because there is a, a degree of freedom of the press in, in the Philippines. Uh, there is still the Catholic Church, which is influential as a, as a moral force which defends the ethnic people and, and is opposed to the war against drugs. So th there is indeed some hope. But uh, Duterte is conducting a rather clever policy, which is both heavy handed uh, militarily and in terms of the war on drugs. But at the same time, he's trying to spend massive, massive amounts of money on infrastructure to encourage investment, particularly in Mindanao, in, in the mining industry. He's fired his environmental minister, who was uh, an environmentalist uh, several mm. months ago. So he's, he, you know, he's being supported by, by big business, by multilateral corporations. And at the same time, he was elected with the support of the left, and even he had ex-communists in, in his government. But now that they've served their purpose, he, he's abandoning them. And uh, he's using this war in the situation in Mindanao, the, 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 the occupation of Mirawi, which went on for about six months, uh, in order to, to perhaps push his authoritarian agenda in the country. So what should indigenous communities be doing now in, in Mindanao, for instance, uh, to defend their land? Uh, you, you mentioned a free press, but what, what other options do they well, have? Well, the, the other important element is to have the, the world watching. Uh, in, there's been reports about Malawan, another island part of, of Mindanao, where there are environmental vigilantes or people actually not violently but defending their land, which have had a degree of success. Mm. So, I mean, there, there's a need for, for international support. There is support within the, the Philippines itself, 
but uh, Jutet's war on drugs and and the, the 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 terrorist activity in southern Mindanao has given him an excuse uh, to to go even further in his authoritarian tendencies, particularly in a context where he's got Donald Trump. Uh, he's in a bromance with Donald Trump, mm. so he's not going to be condemned by the Big the Brother US in the United States. Clearly, isn't David Campbell? Thank you very much for joining us on the program this afternoon. We're going